Welcome to another week of Lunch Money brought to you by Sharesies. At Sharesies, our purpose is to create the most financially empowered generation. So for those of you who are new to Lunch Money, we do these every Thursday at lunchtime. This is a place where you as investors can hear from the people leading some of the available, sorry, some of the companies available on Sharesies and other investing experts. Lunch Money is also available as a podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and Google Podcasts. Please, if you're listening to the podcast, take a moment to leave a rating and comment on Apple Podcasts. We'd really appreciate it. My name's Leighton Roberts. I'm one of the co-founders of Sharesies. And I'm Alice Roundtree. I'm a financial analyst here at Sharesies as well. So just a reminder that if you do have any questions for us, you can submit them through the ask a question box down below. Um, but please don't leave questions in the discussion as they'll likely to be missed. Quick legal disclaimer, we don't give any personalized advice. Investing does involve risk. You're not guaranteed to make money and you might lose the money that you start with. We don't provide personalized advice for recommendations. Everything we speak about here is broad in our opinion only uh, and general and current at the time that we say it. Uh, also, please be kind and respectful towards our speakers and your fellow viewers. Otherwise, we have to take steps to remove you from the webinar and we definitely don't want to so today we are joined by Elan Israelstam. He's one of the co-founders and head of strategy and marketing at BetaShares. So BetaShares is an Australian provider of exchange traded funds. So welcome Elan. Hi guys, hopefully you can uh, see and hear me okay. Love it to be on, on the show. Looking forward to it. Oh, it's great to have you here. Thanks so much for joining us, Elan. We can we can see you. You've uh, joined from uh, fr from Sydney and um, you know, time with some high cases, but uh, really happy that you've been able to make the time for us today. Um, we might just get started with you telling us a little bit about your background uh, and how you got to where you are. I mean, the beta share story, story is very impressive, so we'd um, love to hear about some of how that all started as well. Yeah, well, thank you so much once again. I'm always happy to discuss all things investing and educating uh, investors on on thinking about their investing. So really great to be here. So my story, uh, like many Australians, I, I am here in Sydney, Australia at the moment. Um, like many Australians, I'm an immigrant. Uh, my particular story is I'm a South African immigrant. So I came here with my family when I was in primary school. I went to uni, um, went to the University of New South Wales here in Sydney. Um, I did law and commerce degree. Um, it was a good thing to study, but I must say after the first few weeks I worked out, I didn't really want to be a lawyer, but I did enjoy the law and, and the problem solving aspect of law, et cetera. Um, I always had an entrepreneurial side to me. And I think a lot of that thinking psychologically comes from become, being an immigrant and thinking about understanding just how much my parents gave up to give us a great future, et cetera. So I have very, very m many vivid recollections of, of entrepreneurial pursuits. You know, one of my youngest memories was my brother and I setting up a mini golf or putt-putt course in our backyard in the suburbs and charging the neighborhood kids. You know, I think it was 20 cents at that time to play. Actually quite a big success. So I went on to do a few other bits and pieces that were sort of small business entrepreneurial, you know, a mobile bartending business, uh, some DJing and some cool, some, some good stuff like that. Um, then I took my first real job. Uh, my first real job was in management consulting at, at a company by the name of the Boston Consulting Group. Basically, the BCG, as it's called, um, the idea is to help usually large companies solve problems for senior executives. So, you know, should we get into this particular industry? Should we enter the Chinese market? Should we buy this company? Really great background. Um, I worked in Sydney, New York, uh, met some great people. Actually, a number of whom have really gone on to do some amazing things like the current CEO of Woolworths and the current CEO of Optus and Australia Post. So we had we had a great time. Um, but um, after five and a half years, that entrepreneurial itch really came back and got to me again. And so the thing I decided to do to give myself a real challenge was actually to relocate to China. So I relocated, re relocated to Beijing, China, um, and decided to see if I could get a piece of the growth that was happening there. That was about uh, 13 years ago now. So I ultimately decided to um, set up a company in China, which is actually a, um, a digital ad. You know those screens that you see um, all around, probably Auckland and, and certainly in Sydney and Melbourne, advertising screens. So we had the rights to put up advertising screens in universities. Um, so that was really my first proper business. Um, good fun, but actually quite lonely ultimately. I was the only um, 
after setting up the company, I was the only English speaking person with a staff of about 45 people working for me. So really great experience, but I must say, I, I felt a bit lonely about the whole thing. So after that um, experience, I decided to come back home to Sydney and, and connect with some partners, uh, with my current partners and do something new. And uh, they were friends of mine from university. And we spent some time starting to think about what to launch and what to be involved in. And ultimately, uh, back in 2009, we launched uh, or formed the company BetaShares. We looked at the Australian um, exchange traded fund or ETF industry and launched this company BetaShares. And that's about a 10 and a half year journey to date. So we're now um, one of the largest uh, ETF companies in Australia. Uh, we've got 63 funds, which mix, makes us the largest uh, provider by, by number of funds. And we're managing about 19 billion Aussie dollars. So. So yeah, it's been it's been a good ride, um, not without its challenges along the way, as you as I'm sure you'd imagine. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, some really impressive numbers. Now I feel like every time I um I speak to you, that that number under management grows by another billion or so. So, um, congratulations. Uh, super interested uh, about you know you, you touched on it sort of very briefly there, but how did you end up in ETFs and and beta shares? I feel like I've been saying potentially. That, pronouncing that wrong for quite a while, saying beta shares. So my apologies for that. <laughs> it doesn't um, matter. But yeah. really interested in that and your timing. So what made you think, hey, it's two thousand and nine. This we're talking, <laughs> we're talking a year, a year following um, the GFC, which uh, you know was not great times for um, financial markets. This is the global financial crisis. So maybe tell us a little bit about that thinking. Yeah, exactly. Well, after joining up with those 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 colleagues or partners, we spent a lot of time thinking about. I guess navel gazing, as they say. So we thought about what our skill sets are. We thought about what the markets were doing. We had always had backgrounds in our various different careers in financial services. So I think that side of things was clear. We knew we wanted to do something in financial services. So that was number one. Um, we looked at various different business ideas and different business models. We had heard of ETFs before because by that time, they were already quite a big thing in the US. Um, but things got to the point where some changes had taken place, which really made us think, hey, this is really something really interesting. Um, and I think there's a number of forces that change that. Um, you mentioned the global financial crisis. As it turns out, the global financial crisis is really the perfect time to launch an ETF business. And we had that on our minds at the time of launching. And the reason for that is that um, at the time of the global financial crisis, a whole lot of people lost a whole lot of money. And the money that they lost was invested in primarily actively managed traditional managed funds, as they're called. So investors were at that time, licking their wounds, saying, how do I lose all this money when I gave this money to a professional active manager whose whole job is to protect me from these type of incidents? That actually didn't happen. So really, the truth of the matter is you would have been just as well off by buying an index than investing in a managed fund during the global financial crisis. So the global financial crisis was a really a formative time for the ETF industry because of people's in increased level of scrutiny on, on that active management space on fees and costs because they were thinking, hey, I'm, I'm, charged, I'm, I'm giving this manager all this money and at the end of the day, he's not really protecting me or he or she is not protecting me at all. Also transparency. The whole thing about the global financial crisis is that it was a very opaque time. People didn't, didn't know what had happened. There was this collateralized credit default swaps and all this type of thing that, that you would have heard of if you ever watched you know, the big short. And um, people, uh, you know, people just didn't know what was happening and there was a demand and thirst for transparency. So thinking about some of those things, transparency, cost, uh, simplicity, they're really the things that ETFs are very much known for. And I'm sure a number of your listeners and viewers invest in ETFs, but I'm sure we'll talk about them at the basic level. But that was a formative time. So global financial crisis was a very, very important part of our thinking, just because we think it had all the hallmarks of people wanting a change and to do things in a simpler, cheaper, faster and more efficient way, which is ultimately what ETFs are for investors. That's number one. Number two, we also had in Australia, at least, the rise of what's known as the self-managed super fund market. So that is people managing their own KiwiSaver, to use your language, um, by being able to do what they want with it. So you set up your own fund and it basically becomes um, something you manage yourself. Again, those types of people are people who are typically attracted to the very same things I just mentioned, low cost, um, being able to do things themselves, having control, which are the perfect synonyms really for ETFs. Uh, so that's number two. And probably number three is obviously just backing ourselves and thinking about what we could do, our experience in the market and um, the types of things that we know. And we thought we had a pretty good, pretty good role to play.
um, in the ETF industry in Australia, even though we knew full well we were going to be up against some very large global players. But ultimately, we backed ourselves to, um, to be able to compete with those players. That's really, really interesting to hear. And so yeah, fascinating great. Thanks. to... Um, it's really... <laughs> Sorry, Leighton, I think you're on a lag. <laughs> Um, I was just going to say, really, really interesting to hear about that journey yeah, I am on a bit. post BFC. Um, as you mentioned, you know, you mentioned a couple of things in there around ETFs and how they differ to those traditional managed funds. If we take a bit of a step back, you know, are you able to explain um, to our listeners, you know, what actually is an ETF, and then second, what are some of those differences between an ETF and a managed fund? Absolutely. Look, I'd be happy to. So exchange traded fund is is ETF. That's what it stands for. Um, when think, thinking about that name, exchange traded fund, the name says it all. So first, starting with the exchange traded, that means it is bought and sold on an exchange, you know, whether it be the New Zealand Stock Exchange. In our case, all of them are the Australian Stock Exchange. They're bought and sold like shares. Uh, what that means is that you buy it like a share. You go through a broker like Sharesies or an Australian broker or, or Australian Sharesies, New Zealand Sharesies, whatever the case may be. There's no minimum investment uh, because of the fact you buy and sell like a share. And also because you buy it and sell like a share, they can be bought and sold at any time throughout the trading day, uh, which um, you would appreciate differ from traditional managed funds. So that that's different. Um, the F for fund is, is where the similarities are with a traditional fund. It is a fund, so it's actually one that typically pulls investments together to provide diversification and also protection through the structure, the regulated structure of the fund. So in that regard, ETFs and managed funds are the same. Notably, um, ETFs are often tracked, not all the time, but often track an index. So I'll give you an example. I, as an investor, may want to invest in the global technology sector. I've heard about, or who hasn't, heard and used about, used Amazon, Facebook, Google, I don't really want to make a decision on which of those companies I want to buy. I just want to get access to the global technology sector. You can, for example, buy the NASDAQ 100 ETF. We have one uh, on the ASX called NDQ. You can buy that fund and you get exposure to the top 100 companies in the sector via a single trade. And that would include Google, Amazon, Facebook. So the, really the key benefits of, of that structure are because we don't have to pay anybody to, to manage, um, actively manage these shares, it's usually very low cost. It's accessible because I said it was bought and sold like a share. It's transparent, so every every day you know exactly what's in the portfolio, and it's what we know what we call liquid, which basically means you can buy and sell it at any time. So, ETFs are actually one of the fastest growing industries in in, in the wealth world at the moment. There's actually over nine trillion dollars in US ETF US dollars in ETFs, and there's over nine thousand funds. It's still growing really fast. It's still growing at around twenty percent a year. I'm um, here in Australia. We're at about one hundred and fifteen billion um, Aussie dollars. Uh, but when we started in 2000, and at the beginning of 2010 of 11, it was only five billion dollars. So, um, so that it's growing very fast. So, and then to address the question as to how they differ from managed funds, I think we've kind of answered that. The structure is similar, but the difference is the difference is that these are exchange traded, and and I should just say in terms of specifically putting numbers around costs, they are often p passively managed. So the average ETF will probably cost, I don't know, somewhere between 0.4 or 0.3 percent a year in Australia at least, um, which is about $40 a year for every $10,000 you invest. On average, a traditional fund would be more like one to one and a half percent. So that'd be, you know, three to, you know, four times the price of an ETF. That's such a good explanation. Thank you. And um, you mentioned something in there about passive management and then earlier you mentioned active management. Could you just give a bit of an overview what the difference between those two investing styles is? Yeah, so passive management is a, is a style of managing a, a fund which is just trying to track an index. So I use the example that a lot of people recognize in New Z the um, NASDAQ 100. It could be the New Zealand 50 or the ASX 200 or the FTSE 100. So the passive management style is literally to replicate exactly the returns of that index for an investor, not try to beat it. Active management is typically somebody who is trying to actively manage a portfolio to try and beat an index or try to do something that involves them buying and selling shares for a particular purpose. So that really is the difference between active and passive management. Cool, thank you. And um, you mentioned before as well about how, um, you know, 
the, with managed funds, you've got the fund manager there who is actively trying to make that return for someone. In the GFC, that wasn't necessarily um, it wasn't necessarily a great outcome for for some people. But um, what are the some of the risks of investing in ETFs? Um, you know, if you don't have that active style of management. Yeah, so the risks of investing in ETFs are really come down to the risk of investing in that choice that you make. So it's a risk that you're taking very knowingly. In other words, I want to invest in the global healthcare sector because I believe that that's going to keep on rising, A, because, you know, the age of people is going to continue, the average age is growing. And of course, we've got this COVID situation, which is uh, all over the world. So you might want to say, I want to invest in the global healthcare industry. Now, of course, if you invest in an ETF that tracks uh, an index in the global healthcare industry. If things go bad in the global healthcare industry, if there's a shock, if the markets go down more generally, there is a risk that there will be, a, you know, an under, you know, you you will you will your performance of your of your ETF will also suffer, and that's really the primary risk. So the primary risk is that you know you have made a decision that in, in to to invest in something that that doesn't in, doesn't perform well. Um, but other than that, there's no specific risks, I would say, that are particular to ETFs. And in fact, the fact that they're very diversified in most cases means that compared to investing directly in shares, there's actually much less risk. Um, with managed funds, the theory um, is that, and we do have a number of actively managed uh, ETFs. The theory, though, um, in, from the industry is that in situations where things go bad, the active manager is, is going to be able to help protect from on the downside unfortunately the the actual statistics or the numbers about that don't bear fruit so it's actually not true that actively managed funds do better than passively managed funds when things go bad in the industry and we saw that um, in the global financial crisis and we saw it in this more recent COVID period as well so so that's that's probably what I would say about about risks yeah that was um you touched on something there I was um just about to ask you, how did ETFs perform last year during that sort of COVID drop back in March? Um, yeah, well, it's kind of hard to answer that, isn't it? Because, um, Alice, because um, there are so many types of ETFs. So sort of asking how have ETFs performed is the same thing as sort of saying, did you like that movie? Did you enjoy that movie? Which movie? Just the movie. How, how are movies going, right? Are movies going well or not? Well, some are, some aren't. So basically, the truth is the market for ETFs contains every investment, almost every investment under the sun now. So it's pretty hard to discuss how they perform more generally, how particular sectors perform, how particular ETFs associated with Australian versus Japanese versus European stocks. That's an answer. But I can't answer the question as to how ETFs perform. Um, I will say, as I said before, as a category, they've grown at a very fast rate. I think in New Zealand and in Australia. In Australia here, we've seen around about 70% growth in our industry over the last 12 months. And people are using them more and more as a core of their portfolio, uh, but also in, in terms of using them for trading purposes as well. That's really interesting. And um, interesting, that growth there. I was actually reading an article from NASDAQ, the stock exchange over in America, and talking about um, how ETFs have really grown over the past year as well. So interesting to see that trend flowing through to New Zealand and Australia as well. So if we look a bit more closely at beta shares and what your company does, um, you have touched on a couple of examples of ETFs that you offer, but you know how many do you actually have and what are the different types of sectors and um, industries or styles of investing that people could get exposure to in their portfolios through beta shares? Yeah, so we're, we're fortunate to have the broadest range of ETFs in the in the Australian market. So we do have, as, as I said before, 63 different funds. It really do cover all major asset classes. So actually not just share, share-oriented ETFs, but also bonds and commodities and even currencies. So we actually cover all major asset classes, all major geographic regions, a lot of sectors, a lot of thematics. So the truth of the matter is I think people will um, – able to find what they're looking for with, with beta shares. We think we've got you know, more to offer and we'll continue to grow the number of products we have, but we have a, a very big range and also um, a way for people to invest in a particular style as well. So popular, I'm sure amongst your, 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 your listeners and viewers is ethical investing or ESG oriented investing. So we're also the leader there um, where we offer investments in global shares or in Australian shares that have an ethical component to them. So, yeah, so we've, we've got a very, very broad range. The best thing to do is to jump on our website and have a look. But we certainly know what um, 
you know, the types of clients that, that typically use it, something like shares is do use and, you know, happy to chat about those. But broadly speaking, um, a very, very broad range of, of funds available. Cool. And that, that's so cool to hear about some of those ethical funds. I know that we quite often get questions from our investors around, you know, how can they um, get into that type of investing? What, something I'm quite curious about is how what happens behind the scenes? You know, how do you actually construct the portfolio so that it tracks these various indexes? Yeah, well, it's actually quite simple, um, which is good. So I'll just get a little bit technical, but please stop me if I get too technical. So, I mean, as I said before, in the vast majority of our funds, we try to trade, um, we try to track an index. So how we do that is... We actually, inv the people that invest with us are actually large institutions in the main, which are known as market makers. So we basically face off against these large institutions. And what that happens is that they, they basically trade with us, and I'll come to how it all works. And then they will offer to end investors such as yourselves or your customers on shares is the units from our ETF. So the way that it works is that if there is a demand for our ETFs, at the end of the day, those market makers will do what's known as send an application. So in other words, just apply to invest. Um, and they ask us to create, as it's known, more ETF units on, the, on of, of a particular ETF. So to do that, we take the funds that come ultimately from, um, from investors who then pass them on to these market makers. And they then we go ahead and buy all the stocks in the underlying portfolio. So for example, NASDAQ 100, at the, at the, you know, at the end of our day or at the beginning of the US day, we will buy all the stocks in the... Um, in the NASDAQ 100, so all 100 stocks in the relevant proportion to their index. So, you know, if Apple, were, for example, represented 5%, we'd buy 5%, you know, of, of however much came in in Apple. And then basically we pass the units. So we take the money, we buy the, we buy the stocks, we pass the units of our ETF back to those market makers, and then they're used to facilitate buys and sells to the end investors throughout the trading day. And also, as the market grows, there's more and more buying and selling between individual investors as well. So when you're buying an ETF, you're either buying and selling from somebody else who owns that product or you're buying and selling against that market maker. But we we only trade with that market maker and only at the end of the day so we can make sure we have um, enough, uh, you know, have the ability to create that, that product. That's sort of how it works. And so you create your own portfolios because I've, do you? Because I've heard of some ETFs that actually just invest in other ETFs, say if you're you're based in one country and you're wanting to construct an ETF that's tracking, say, the US index, that they'll just then invest in a US index. So do you do any of that? or is that A little bit, a little bit. But that's only where it's more efficient for the end investor. The vast majority of what we do is just buying and selling those, those shares directly. Cool. Thank you. So you've got a bunch of uh, New Zealand investors. I'm back, hopefully. Got rid of this lag um, with a refresh. But... Um, the what are your plans for New Zealand, if any? Well, we've obviously got a very, very close affinity and um, with New Zealand, uh, both from a cultural and, and obviously sort of geographical perspective. So we're having a really close look at, at the New Zealand market for ETFs. To us, it feels like New Zealand investors should be able to access more choice on the New Zealand Stock Exchange when it comes to ETF. And we also think it's probably worthwhile there being some competition in that market. So we look at the ETF market in the New Zealand and we, it looks a lot like our industry, you know, about 10 years ago. We think that things will change quite a lot in the future in terms of choice, fees and options available. So, I mean, number one, obviously, anyone who can buy and sell on the ASX, which obviously can be done through, you know, shares um, and other brokers, uh, you can buy our products already um, uh, but by simply um, just going ahead and buying them during the Australian trading day. Um, uh, but uh, on top of that, we think there's an opportunity to potentially look at doing some stuff um, domestically in New Zealand and on the New Zealand Stock Exchange. And we think we've got a lot to offer. So I think it's more of a watch the space sort of conversation yeah. at this stage. All right, cool. Um, just one out of interest, the name Beta Shares. I mean, Beta is obviously a well-known fi finance term. How did you land on that? Yeah, so it's well known probably to, to, to nerds like maybe you and me, Layton. I don't think it's well known <laughs> to everybody who's listening. Um, beta, yeah, beta means the market performance. So I mentioned that a lot of our funds, they simply just try to, instead of trying to outperform a market, they just give you exposure to the market. So you basically buy the market with an ETF. So naturally we thought, well, hang on, this is, yeah, these are kind of like shares. They're not their ETFs, but they, 
to many people, they're going to feel and smell and, 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 and act like shares. So the shares part was, yep, okay. And so this is, these are shares that provide you beta, you know, provide you access to a particular, to particular marketplace. Since then, of course, we've actually got funds that are not just providing beta in the technical sense, but we think the name still, still works. Nice. We might get on to a few questions from um, the people listening in, eh? We've got a, a few lined up, so I'll just jump into them. Uh, so the first one from uh, someone called FX, it's a cool name. Uh, hi, how did you uh, or how did you position beta shares to compete against the likes of iShares, um, Spider, etc.? Yeah, exactly. So that's right. I mean, uh, we do have some very large competitors. In fact, our two largest competitors in Australia happen to be the largest fund managers in the world. I think combined they would have more funds under management than most countries' GDPs. Um, so very, very large companies. So we did think long and hard about how we would position ourselves and compete against those large firms. A couple of things really come to mind. Number one is just being a specialist. So we only do exchange traded funds or ETFs, whereas our other the other the guys that own the likes of iShares and Spider, which were the two names mentioned there by um, your your viewer or your listener FX, is they are they're arms of much bigger companies with a whole lot of different things that they do. So they do those traditional funds. They have software businesses. They're involved in other parts of the value chain of financial services. We only do ETFs, and that's been a very big part of, of what we do. Second of all, uh, we know that we can be much faster and in many regards much more innovative than, 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 than those players just simply because of our size and, and our speed. So we've been much more nimble, and that's why we've we've obviously been focusing so much on things like product development and new products. So we've been first to market multiple, multiple times with new products. Um, we also, I think, we differ in that in the way in which we communicate with with our investors globally, and that is we try to be a little bit more um, relatable and and give people knowledge on a bit more of a plain English basis, perhaps. And that's because of the very fact that we are built for the end investor rather than being, as I said, just one part of a much broader organization. So hopefully when people come to our website or listen to us or you know even hear us talking like this, they can tell there's a bit of a difference in the way we communicate and educate our customers. So that's that. And and I think, look, other than that, I think it's just about um, being, you know, being very, very focused, as I've said, in everything that we do. Um, and I'm happy to say that it's actually worked. So right now we, you know, we have been for a long time well ahead of a number of those large firms in terms of market share and uh, in terms of inflows. So I think, Leighton, you'd probably re resonate very clearly with that from your own experience with your building out shares. Is you know, you can be a small player, and in many regards, it's the devil you know. Knowing how those players operate is a comforting thing because they can be quite predictable. Um, they're very, very impressive, and you have to always respect them. But you kind of know exactly what large players will do, and we've been able to to really disrupt on that basis. Yeah, nice. Thanks. Um, the next one is: What is your view? Um, if one has shares of popular companies, is it worth it to invest in an ETF which has similar shares in its portfolio? Well, it's all going to come down to how many of those shares you own. So I think what we're finding, and I'm sure you can you can you can relate to this from your own data, very very few people own a lot of companies. So they may have you know one or two companies in their portfolio, or three or four, or a handful of blue chip names, but very few have got a very diversified portfolio. So I think that if you have an ETF that includes maybe one or two of the of the companies that you own, but it still has a very large range of other companies in it that provide you that much needed diversification, it can make a lot of sense. However, if you own like 10 or 12 of the largest, for example, technology names, uh, which very few people do, and then you go and buy a global technology ETF, that would be overkill. And that's where you go find something that is actually more uh, complementary and perhaps in a totally different sector that helps you in your portfolio. So I think the other thing as well is um, the thing about it, an ETF is that it does track an index. So the good thing about it is that as companies get bigger, ultimately the ETF is buying more of those companies. So there's some entrenched sort of, we call it rebalancing, or there's some sort of entrenched trading going on that gives you access without having to do anything. So it's a perfect way to, to build wealth by setting and forgetting and just dollar cost averaging, for example, into something without having to worry about, hey, am I overweight one particular stock or underweight one particular stock? So we do think for the vast majority of people, it's 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 a very good vehicle to become the core of your portfolio. Uh, 
Yeah, nice. I think uh, we have an extremely varied customer base, but of course we have a bit of a bell curve um, and right in the middle of that bell curve is about three funds and um, four companies. So that's basically what the average investor looks like uh, at, at shares. Is. Um, the next question is, some people argue that investing in passive ETFs is looking like in the rear view mirror. Do you have any comments on that? Um, that's actually well, not a I phrase I've heard. No, I haven't heard that either, but it's great. I think I think um, I don't obviously agree with that um, because, as I mentioned, it's not that passive investing is, means that what's actually happening underneath it is entirely passive. All that passive means is that you are not trying to beat a market. But it's very, very important to understand. Just back to the comment I just made previously about rebalancing. So this is a, this is a situation where every quarter or sometimes every half year, the index itself. Uh, will will rebalance its underlying companies based upon its rules. So, for example, um, the NASDAQ 100, to continue with that example. So the NASDAQ 100 has the largest 100 companies in the, um, in, on the NASDAQ stock exchange. Um, and it also adds companies that immediately become, that become the, a part of the 100 very quickly. So as an example, um, you know, thinking about a very large company like a Coinbase, as an example, I mean, it's not on the NASDAQ, it's actually on the New York Stock Exchange, but assuming it was on the NASDAQ, uh, if you were tracking a fund that was you know, trading the New York Stock Exchange, maybe the S&P 500, and Coinbase became big enough to be part of that 500, it would become part of the index, which means that your passive ETF is still buying into that new and exciting story. So I actually think there's a lot of flux going on and a lot of movement inside passive investing, and that's why I don't think there's anything going rear view in that. It is true that nobody's trying to predict the future with passive ETFs in a way that fund managers do. But I would ask anybody to prove to me that somebody can predict the future perfectly all the time. Uh, and sometimes trying to predict the future, you can equally get it wrong as well as right, uh, which probably means that, back to my sort of statistical analysis, this is the reason why so many people who try to pick stocks underperform their index. In fact, it's around about 80% of professionals. So these are professionals. They actually do this for a living and still only 20% outperform that index, say over a five or, or a sort of 10 year period. So that would be my comment on that one. Yeah, nice. I, I sort of take a pretty balanced view to all these things. We speak with lots of active and passive managers on this podcast. And um, my personal view is like diversification across all things. Like I have both those things in my portfolio because I'm also a believer that you know, you make your money with risks and part of that is trying to guess something into the future. So, um, but but on the other side of that, you've got to keep it somehow too and diversification and the passive stuff's interesting. But I just want to touch on one more thing, which is uh, becoming quite an important thing, actually. Uh, you, you know, you, you mentioned rebalancing, which is when a company decides to realign to us or a fund decides to realign to, an, um, to, to the index that it's tracking. But there's actually starting to become quite material differences between which index you might end up tracking and whether it's decided, say, to cap to 5% or whether um, it's decided to do monthly rebalancing versus, um, versus quarterly or um, half yearly. How, how do you come to a point of deciding on this for your funds? Yeah, so you're right. It, what it means, first of all, take up the first point of your, your comment there, Leighton, is that people really do need to look into what index an ETF is tracking. Just because it says something on its as its name, they should just at least familiarize themselves with what that index actually is. There can be quite big differences, you know, an equal weighted versus a market cap index. There's a huge difference there in terms of the portfolio exposure that you get or the exposure to companies that you get. Um, now, how do we decide? I mean, we basically just take a view on trying to understand what the investors want. And that's how we think about it. So sometimes we think what investors want, for example, is just simply the largest companies in a particular sector. So um, what we need to make sure is that that index is true and pure. I'll use an example. We've got a quite a successful fund, which is the Global Cybersecurity ETF with a with an with a ASX code of HACK, which is quite a nice code. Um, so we thought, okay, there's something in global cybersecurity. It's, it's a pretty interesting theme. Clearly, you know, people are going to continue, or companies and businesses and, and individuals are going to continue to spend more and more money trying to secure themselves. So that means the industry has real legs in terms of, you know, its, its, you know, its, its future performance. So we thought that was cool. So we came up with that idea. Then we said, okay, if somebody wants to invest in that, we just have to make sure that they're actually getting what they think they're getting. So the companies that are in that index, they need to be real pure play cybersecurity companies, not companies who have 10% of their revenue in cybersecurity, but real co companies that actually are, 
So we define what that is, what cybersecurity actually is, number one. And then in that particular case, we think, well, actually what people really want is, is the bigger players in that space and, 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 um, and making sure they have a good portfolio that's quite diverse. So that's how we go about thinking about these things. We always think with the end customer in mind about what they're actually wanting. And, um, and then we'll develop the index thereafter. And often we're, you know, we're working with professional index providers. We don't do the indices ourselves. We are choosing others or we're helping to design it along with a, you know, with a third party provider. Yeah, great. Um, one last cheeky question from me. Sorry, and then I'll ask very quickly the last, uh, some of the other ones have forgotten the thing, but I think it's topical right now because I'm interested in how you choose to deal with currency. Um, you know, I know some are currency hedged, some are not. I think it's very topical right now, particularly in New Zealand, we've seen, I think yesterday the ASX was up, the uh, the US markets were up, uh, and overall our investors' portfolios are down, and that's because um, there was an announcement yesterday in New Zealand which drove the New Zealand dollar up. And yeah. um, once adjusted, that means New Zealanders now obviously have stronger buying power into these other markets, so they can um, technically buy things a little bit cheaper than what they could yesterday morning. Um, but it's also this relationship. So how do you manage that and communicate that with your investors or even make that decision? Yeah, well, how do we communicate it is the easy part. So we'll so we have some of our funds. You'll see after their name it says dash currency hedge. Now, notably, that's obviously for Australian dollar currency hedge. So just you know, mm -hmm. bear that in mind. So you're basically going to be, you know, you're basically going to have what that will mean is that in New Zealand, if you were to invest in a currency hedge fund in Australia, that means you're getting the underlying exposure to that, you know, to that particular, um, you know, to that you, to to the Aussie dollar um, as well as the investment. So that's important. But in terms of how we communicate it, that's how it's just simply by by writing it. Um, we we really do choose different um, hedging strategies depending on the underlying sort of structure. So I'll give you an example: um, gold. For and then I will talk from an Australian perspective here because it's obviously currency hedged into Australian dollars. So the thing about gold as an example is that there are times, a number of times in history, where the price of gold rises at the same time as which the Aussie dollar rises. And why is that? Well, I mean, not to get too boring, but because the Aussie dollar is usually related to commodities um, because of the fact that we've got so much mining here. And gold is a commodity. So you can have the situation where you've made the right decision to invest in gold and actually the gold price of gold has gone up, but there's a commodity rally. And in that situation, it's the worst situation ever where you've made the right decision, your gold price has gone up 10%, but maybe or 5%. And maybe the, because the, the Aussie dollar is seen as a commodity currency, it's also gone up 5%, you end up with no return. So in something like that, where you really, we think that most people are buying something like gold for the exposure to gold rather than the currency exposure, we think that it can make sense to currency hedge. So that's how we think about it. We really just make those decisions. Um, overall, for long, long-term investors, and I'm hoping that's where the vast majority of your investors are, but I might be wrong. There's probably a lot of traders there too. For long-term investors, overall though, um, it doesn't make that big a difference, currency hedging or non-currency hedging over long periods, but it certainly makes very big differences over, over shorter periods of time. I really like that answer. I haven't necessarily thought about it that my way myself, but it's probably, I'm going to go think about it afterwards, but it might become um, part of how I answer some questions as well. But yeah. the, uh, this whole idea of what are you investing here? If, uh, are you investing in the company or are you investing in the currency? Because that probably makes quite a, and both of those are very valid decisions. And I also agree over the long period of time, dollar cost averaging tends to work itself out um, across currency, just like it does over shares. But all right, we've got a couple more questions. Um, since I've selfishly stolen a couple myself. Uh, if we could just quick fire these ones, uh, Elan, because I, I just don't have the time there. Um, no so worries. the first one is, uh, where do you see New Zealand market in 10 years? Yeah. Now, are we talking about the New Zealand share market here? I wonder what um, what this particular investor is asking about. Um, I think Zealand we can, I think, I think we'll be talking share market, yeah. Yeah, well, look, you guys would be much, much better placed than I would on the New Zealand share market. Um, you know, it's very, very hard to predict, as I've said before, um, the performance of any share market. I think right now the global outlook um, for shares, in our opinion, and I'll probably you know think about it from an Australian perspective, noting that Australia and New Zealand are very, very similar. Uh, they've performed really well. I mean, over the last year, and that's primarily due to this V-shaped recovery, as we call it, um, from you know from from sort of COVID, and also the fact that China and the United States and all these big markets are doing very well. So. I, you know, the market in Australia has been strong, and I'm pretty sure that's true of New Zealand as well. Um, there's a few th reasons for that. You know, people are not um, – the debts in, for example, home home debts are not as bad as people thought. The housing market's going crazy, and I know it's the case in New Zealand for a fact, and I'm sure it's the top of the, top of the town. Everyone's asking that question. 
There's also been strong performance in resources and technology has been performing well. So overall, I would say to this particular person, the outlook is encouraging. The market valuation um, you know, has come down a little bit in Australia, um, which is also, also encouraging. We use things like price to earnings ratios and these types of things. And um, at least in Australia, and I think it's true in New Zealand, the rates, the interest rates are expected to stay on hold for quite a long time. So those are encouraging signs for share markets. Um, the bigger risk right now sitting here today in, in, in Sydney in July of 2021 is just this COVID. What is, you know, are, are the variants going to get much worse? Is it going to sort of break through a vaccine? That could cause huge, huge problems that would set you back a long, long time. But right now, I would say the outlook's encouraging. Um, for, for, for share investors more generally, and I would argue with for New Zealanders as well. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? I, I mean, you touched on commodities for the Australian market, and, you know, I'm sure there's lots of um, lots of runway left in commodities as far as supporting the market, but I do like that Australia is starting to see quite a big tech resurgence as well, or not even resurgence, it's just tech starting to come into some of those bigger companies, and the, yeah. I think that's really exciting. If I looked at the New Zealand market, that's what I'd really like to see out of that for our companies, because we're, we're um, not so much commodities, but very resources. You know, um, A2 Milk, for example, is a huge part of our index. It's down about 50% year on year or something at the moment, and things like that can have a massive impact. As a result, it looks like the New Zealand market's under underperforming if you look compared to Australia and all the US exchanges. But in reality, it's just this one behemoth that's um, we're a couple of really large ones that are causing some drag. But yeah, some super interesting um, times. And I think you know the other thing I just add for both of our companies is the democratization of investing and having many more people because you talk to the V recovery, the, the other recovery is the K recovery, right? Which is the the wealthy getting wealthy, those who own um, these investments doing very well out of it, and those who don't um actually um not doing very well out of this v shape at all and um you know i think both part of the the, the dna or purpose of both of our companies is to make sure that we can have more people on this part so that we don't end up with the this one so i think that's i think as long as that continue i'm i'm hugely motivated by this movement of more people owning um these assets but absolutely um, last question is, what voting rights per se do investors and beta shares have? Otherwise, yeah. is there any disclosure or policies as to how you vote? Yeah, so you can't vote individually inside an ETF. Uh, we, beta shares um, does that for you, but there's a lot of transparency on our website around that. As an example, I think we're one of the one of the few businesses that are passive that on our ESG funds, which is obviously one of the key things that people care about when it comes to voting. We vote in a way we direct the vote in a way that aligns with our ethical screens and we also engage with companies if they don't meet our ethical screens so you'll be able to see the results of of the voting process on our website at any time so there is transparency um but the individuals themselves do not you know do not vote we we vote on behalf of of the unit holders um and as i said uh in most cases in line with the index but in some cases we actually use our own um screens particularly as it relates to ethical funds which is as i said one of the key the key areas that people are concerned about when it comes to voting cool thank, thank you, you John. um and i do have to apologize actually i was saying beta shares before but as you as you mentioned it's beta beta shares well it's potato potato <laughs> tomato tomato there's nothing wrong with it, it's all good. It's all good. No, but um, thank you so much for your time today. That's been super informative to learn just all about ETFs, how they work, and and um, Beta shares a story as well. So thank you to everyone who's tuned in today. Um, next Thursday, we will be joined by Debbie Birch. So Debbie has over 30 years of experience in financial markets. Um, most re More recently, she's been a professional director, and her focus has been on Māori economic development. So join us next week to hear from Debbie, her career journey, and some of her most recent and areas of focus you can register on the link we've just put that um over to the side there uh ilan thank you so much again for joining us we've really enjoyed the chat and i, I don't think this is the last we'll be seeing you uh, hopefully on the uh on the shares is lunch money um been been really interesting and like i say best of luck to you and the team uh over in sydney with everything that's going on we're definitely um thinking about you all uh enjoy the weekend we'll see you next week uh matawa.